get started. People can take their seats. So welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Director for Global Health Policy here. We're really pleased today to host a team from the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, and particularly the Director for the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact. I think that's a new office that was started under the current administration. And uh, they've put together the very useful market shaping primer that's available outside. I hope you all got a chance to look at it. And I think it's a real contribution, especially because many people talked about a lot of different things under that topic. And I think today we'll talk about a lot of those different things. We'll see where the concept ends, where it starts, where the borders are, um, and go from there. So let me turn it over now to Wendy, who's the director of the center. Thanks, Wendy. Take signals from Amy and uh, <laughs> All right, so um, hello, everybody. Uh, so first of all, thank you to Amanda and the Center for Global Development for hosting us here and, and, uh, and launching our new market shaping primer. And, and thanks, all of you, for, for coming out this afternoon. So market shaping is definitely an um, important topic, also sort of increasingly discussed topic. Uh, maybe the, the uh, term du jour and, and uh, becoming sort of a sexy thing for people to, in, in our nice little wonky world of uh, Washington, uh, uh, for, for people to think about. And, and so we're excited to be able to share with you uh, much of what we have learned so far. And, uh, and so uh, let me just step back for a minute. And, and one of the things, and I think I mean, we've got a, a diverse audience here today. I think we've got a nice mixture of people who are deep expertise in this field all the way over to and um, perhaps some people that are, are relatively new to uh, the topic and so I'm just going to step back a little bit and talk uh, a bit about uh, why we think this is so important. So one of the things we know is that we have a lot of life-saving products, interventions that uh, are available but yet they fail to reach their intended targets, uh, individuals in some of these are harder to reach communities. And, uh, and so we actually established the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact uh, to address that very issue of how can we do a better job of making sure we uh, can, can get some of these life-saving interventions out to those who need them uh, quickly uh, and at the scale we need. And so we've, we did this by bringing, uh, setting up the center to bring in a lot of business and marketplace thinking into how we do that. And, uh, and so we've, we've established a, a great team. And, uh, and as, we, as we think about how to uh, better introduce and scale, one of the ways we can do that is just thinking about how do we design products that are right fit for markets. Uh, and that requires bringing that thinking all the way back to the earlier stages of development. But we also need to make sure we have better planning for introduction, better planning for scale up. Again, that actually has to happen very early on. And we think if we can do that, we should be able to start seeing faster introduction, faster uptake of interventions. And, uh, and, and as, as a little uh, early advanced uh, 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 hint of what's to come, we actually have a, a intro scale up guide that we will be putting out in a couple of months. So you heard it here first and gave milestones sitting in the back. Um, so we'll, we'll have more to come on that one. But all the, all the planning and uh, planning and preparation for, for product launch and uptake may only get you so far. In some cases, it may be all you need, but we're also talking about introducing products in some pretty tricky uh, markets uh, that have some real inefficiencies. And, and in some of those cases, we need better tools to be able to address those market inefficiencies. And that's where market shaping can come in. So, um, so we, um, I know this is, this is a concept that 
perhaps is relatively new, and maybe, I'm not even sure if Oliver Sabat is the one who gets it, maybe Kanika uh, uh, gets full credit for uh, coining the term, uh, but it's certainly not a new concept. We've been doing market shaping uh, through other names uh, for, for years now, and, uh, and there's been a lot of lessons built up over those years in terms of, of how to address market inefficiencies. How can we incentivize innovators to develop markets for, or develop products for insufficient markets uh, with limited return? Um, how can we enhance some of these underlying markets? Uh, there's lots of tools out there, and we've really built up a great base of knowledge over the years. Um, groups like Chai, Gates Foundation, Unitaid, uh, R4D now, many groups have actually really been great pioneers in taking a lot of these tools and, and figuring out what tools work well and, and getting some pretty impressive results. And we're going to hear about that today. So what we wanted to do with the primer was think about how can we take a lot of these lessons learned and, and, and this is a sort of a great moment in, moment in time to be able to take a lot of these lessons learned, pull them together, and, and help us uh, look at, at sort of this landscape as, as we go forward and, and better apply these tools uh, to some of the challenges we face today. But part of that is figuring out um, how do we recognize uh, when, when there are market inefficiencies, better understand what's causing those inefficiencies? What are the right tools to apply uh, and when to apply them? What are some of the unintended consequences if we do this wrong? So anytime you monkey around with markets uh, uh, and, and try to influence markets, there, there can be some unintended consequences that result. And if you really haven't thought that through, or you haven't learned from uh, looking uh, at its use in other places, uh, you may miss something that actually could be uh, quite important. Um, the other thing is that I think we have a great tendency to get excited about that bright, shiny object. So for a while, advanced market commitments, that was the bright, shiny object. And, and so you started to see, oh, everybody would say, oh, I want one. And, uh, and you end up with decision making getting driven by the, the new bright, shiny thing and, uh, and not driven by the uh, better understanding of what's the problem, what's causing the problem, what's the right tool for the problem. So as we started to look at this for USAID, we, we actually wanted to make sure that there was a good for practice and discipline in place to be able to help us think through that, um, that process of figuring out right tool for right problem. And, and better understanding the problem. It also helps arm us as, as other policymakers start pushing forward ideas without really thinking about the, uh, the back end. So we've, we've been at this, uh, uh, developing this primer for the last year. We held a, la a lab, a market shaping lab, about a year ago, pulling in really some of the top thinkers in market shaping uh, and, and started engaging in the what are the lessons learned and, and how can we apply this um, uh, 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 pull it all together in a way that, that sort of helps us all uh, be on a nice common ground and go forward. And so we've we developed this primer with significant input from those folks who are on the panel today uh, and a number of other players, uh, not perhaps not in the room today, but uh, uh, who have been enormously helpful and we, we have owe a, a debt of gratitude. Um, this, there are probably elements to this that are uh, certainly debatable. Um, there are pieces of this where uh, you can argue of where to draw that line, what is and what is not market shaping. Um, is there a bright line, how far to extend it? There's lots of people that can debate that. In my view, that's sort of the less interesting thing to do, and it's much more about what are the tools, um, how do we know when to apply them. And, and also, there are a range of other things we need to do to get products to scale, and, and if we have to tackle those, we tackle those too. And whether or not we call it market shaping, that's, that's sort of less of a, an issue. So we can debate that today uh, too, but uh, anyway, just to, to close and then really get to the good stuff, um, you know, I think you know, as we look at the enormity of the challenges we face, whether we're talking about uh, uh, creating an AIDS-free generation, bringing an end to preventable child maternal deaths, uh, it's, it's important that we continue to think about new ways of doing business. And, uh, and as, as the 
sort of thinking and practice behind market shaping uh, continues to evolve and our learning uh, evolves with it, I think we're going to develop some very powerful tools that will help us in that effort. So today we want to just continue that conversation, uh, bring all of you into it, share what we've learned, and, uh, and then uh, also let you hear from some of the experts who have done a lot of work. So with that, um, I'm very happy to uh, invite Amy Lynn up to the, uh, the podium, who's going to walk you through some background on, uh, on the primer itself. Um, I have to say and acknowledge uh, Joe Wilson also uh, here in the room today. The two of them have been co-authors in pulling all of this together and, and have done a great job. Uh, but I will turn the floor over to Amy. Thank you for that background, Wendy, and, and thank you again to Center for Global Development for hosting us today. As Wendy explained when, in some background, we have been pulling from lessons learned and the experiences that we've gathered across the health sector and developing these ideas and principles for the market shaping primer. And so we've tried to learn from what's happened in the HIV space, malaria, family planning, vaccines, and others to really see what shared commonalities we can find and how to uh, provide that guidance as we think about future uh, interventions. Since many of those interventions have been done at the global level, and have been focused on product markets, so actual drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, et cetera. Uh, that's what we'll be focusing on today, and that's in the focus of the primer as well. Uh, although we recognize that there can be opportunities to apply these ideas to service delivery uh, interventions as well. But just to give some context for the scope of what we were attempting to tackle with, with the primer here. But let's talk about the end goal of what we're even looking for with market shaping. Because we're not thinking about shaping markets and making them more efficient just for their own sake, but really trying to get to the end user and provide uh, important health products that can save lives or reduce morbidity for the communities in developing countries that are our global health focus. And in trying to think about the barriers uh, that um, that process may encounter, we recognize that there's a broader health ecosystem that's engaged. And so you need manufacturers to actually produce products. You need procurers or donors to have the financing to buy them. Um, bodies and policymakers and ministries of health in developing country markets to uh, be informed about those products, uh, register them, add them to the essential medicine lists and treatment guidelines, et cetera. Uh, supply chains that can distribute those medicines to those who need them most, and then ultimately the health care providers who need to be informed on both the health need as well as the benefits of that product so that they can therefore advise this end user. And when we show it this way, it looks very neatly organized and linear, but we know that when you actually look at the country level, it's much more complicated. And all of these different bodies and organizations are interacting with each other, which makes sense. You need the suppliers to um, be informing the supply chain and the providers about their products and the ministries of health and other policymakers to be um, updated about upcoming products, the donors and the procurers to be strengthening the different aspects, et cetera. And this web of engagements and interactions between these different organizations in a market is what we're focusing on in the primer, in market shaping. It's these green arrows that are really the emphasis that we're using for thinking about how can we make those processes more efficient and, and maximize their effectiveness. Because if even one of those interactions goes wrong or it becomes less efficient or faces a hurdle, it can affect the dynamic throughout the market and, and hamper access to the end user. So we take a very messy process on the ground and we try to provide some structure to get at hopefully appropriate solutions or, or market shaping interventions. And then to the question of what are we even talking about? I think um, in past meetings I've heard that market shaping is everything and nothing all at the same time. And that doesn't seem like a very useful starting point for planning any future opportunities or, or thinking about how can we help a market work more efficiently to provide the access that we're looking for for those end users. So when we think about a, a working definition and a starting point, we, we settled on looking at the purchasing power, the financing, influence, or access to technical expertise that countries, donors, and procurers have access to to address root causes of, of those red arrows, the, the less efficient interactions, to hopefully improve health outcomes. 
And when we think about who might find this uh, primer and these types of approaches useful, we're really targeting global health experts and decision makers, like many of the people sitting in this room, who know the problems on the ground very, very well and are interested in this approach and possibly uh, resolving those issues or, or mitigating them if it's appropriate. And these decision makers could sit in donor agencies. They may be part of implementing partner organizations, consultancies, advisory groups, um, national government offices, ministries of health or finance, or on the supply side of actually producing these materials or distributing them. So I move through all of that fairly quickly to set up the context to actually move us to the framework uh, that, that Wendy had mentioned up front, these five steps that are fairly straightforward, but also uh, deliberately intended to be flexible so that we can apply them to different types of health product markets. So it starts with observing what's happening in the market and where the shortcomings may exist, moving on to actually diagnosing the root causes underlying those shortcomings, assessing the market shaping options that may be available, implementing an intervention in a way that is customized to the needs of that specific product market, and then measuring the results very carefully as we move forward. So I'll speak to each of these individually, but um, here are some key questions and considerations that we've discussed in the primer. And so when you flip through the report, you'll see um, these pieces that we should consider as we approach each of these steps. And then we walk through them in more detail of how other practitioners have addressed these questions through their own experiences and across health sectors. But let me actually start with the first step. So observing the market shortcomings. And here we have five different characteristics of a health product market that we can consider as we think about uh, what is uh, occurring in the marketplace and, and what may not be um, optimized. And these five A's uh, for, for easy memorization is affordability, availability, assured quality, appropriate design, and awareness. And these definitions are fairly straightforward. They're, they're probably what you would expect um, in describing uh, these different characteristics of a market. But I'll just point out two uh, that may not be as obvious in the way that we're interpreting these. So availability is really speaking to both the global supply and the local supply. So making sure at the global level there are enough um, suppliers to, to have a balanced supplier base and also that they have the capability to produce enough of the good to meet the global demand. And at the local level to make sure that the product doesn't just reach the border of that country but can actually be distributed throughout and, and reach those end users. And on the awareness side, really reflecting the importance of demand in thinking about product markets. So many of these characteristics may be looking at the supply side, but we have to remember that it's critical for the end user to be informed about the product as well as healthcare providers and any key influencers. So these are a set of market characteristics that we want to look at when we think about observing a market. We also want to make sure that we look at them as an integrated whole, as we try to symbolize with the little ribbon connecting these different puzzle pieces. We don't want to isolate any one of these characteristics and just focus on, for, for example, uh, affordability at the expense of every other characteristic, because that contributes to the overall sustainability of that, of that market and ensuring its health. So if these are the market characteristics, what could go wrong? What are the shortcomings that we might encounter? And here we've listed a few that we've seen in different product markets. Not an exhaustive list. Certainly other inefficiencies may occur. But this gives you a sense of what could be the shortcomings that we would observe in a sample product market that you may be focused on. So some of the problems represent extremes in a value. So the price might be too high, or there might be a shortage of availability. Those are clearly problems. But the other, the other nature of a shortcoming could be volatility. And so if availability swings between excess product one year and then shortage the next year, that can also uh, create a huge barrier for planning on both the side of uh, procurers and of suppliers. And so recognizing both extremes can be problems as well as the volatility between those extremes. The other type of shortcoming that I'll point out is um, thinking about awareness and how oftentimes we might think, well, the main problem would be low awareness. Not enough end users or not enough healthcare providers recognize the value of uh, this health product or the importance of this health need. 
but overuse, which might lead to resistance and the undermining of the effectiveness of that health product can also be a problem. So we recognize that there are different nuances to how these shortcomings might appear in different product markets. And that's why, as we move away from the first step, we really need to uh, emphasize the importance of data and analysis in the second step of diagnosing the root causes. So once we have a sense of those different shortcomings, how do we think about what market shaping can do to address the root causes that are, are leading to those shortcomings? And here we've tried to categorize um, the types of market shaping interventions into three groups. The first is reducing transaction costs. The second is increasing the amount of market information. And the third is balancing risks between suppliers and buyers. And so on the first uh, grouping, it's really thinking about lowering the structural hurdles, making it easier for buyers and suppliers to engage. On the second, it's increasing market information, which may be generating new data and, and providing that to uh, a market that previously didn't have it. Or it could be making existing information more transparent and more visible to those who, who need it for their planning and their engagement. And the third is balancing financial risks between suppliers and buyers in a way that's productive for the overall market to operate more efficiently. So I won't be able to talk through every intervention that we outlined in the primer um, in detail, but what the overall essence of what we want to be using um, with these, this categorization of these root causes is mapping them to how different interventions can address them. And you'll notice here, it's symbolized by these check marks that some interventions may be able to address more than one of these root causes. And in the same way, we may find product markets that have multiple root causes at play that we need to be addressing. So I'll list through a few of the, the interventions that we do talk through in more detail in the primer, um, where we talk about how they work, what are the pros, the cons, the prerequisites in order for them to succeed, as well as specific examples where they've been used in the past in different health areas. So if you're interested in any one specific intervention, I do encourage you to, to look at that section closely and, and see what those examples are. But for here, to give you a sense of the range of interventions that we talk through, I've listed a, a few. And again, they're meant to be a starting point to think through the options that may be available. So the COGS represent um, more efficient uh, market operations and, and reduce transaction costs. And so here you can see uh, that some relate to procurement and tendering, such as pooled procurement and coordinated ordering. Um, others look at optimizing the, the product options, making sure there's enough choice, but also sufficient volumes to encourage suppliers to continue manufacturing. And that'd be variant optimization. And then the last two are really looking at country systems that can facilitate a market's operations, whether it's making it easier to register in that country or um, ensuring quality assurance systems are, are easier to move through. The second category, which is symbolized by the, the bubbles and the people speaking, are the market information, um, increasing market information. And so the first two, again, is looking at how can we create or generate data or um, analysis that is productive for the different actors in this market, whether it's a landscape analysis, a strategic demand forecasting, or other types of assessments that could be beneficial for the buyers or the suppliers to, to engage with each other. And the bottom two, the pricing information exchange and the quality, the quality assessment, are really bringing to light existing information. So sharing the prices or the sales that are um, already being conducted, um, publicizing and conducting quality assessments so that everybody um, can have more transparency in their operations and in their engagements can also make a market work more efficiently. And the last category is probably the group that's most uh, closely associated with market shaping interventions. And so these include the advanced market commitment, volume guarantee, which really offset future demand risk for uh, potential suppliers. Um, they also include ways of generating demand, such as promotion incentives or channel subsidies, um, and inclusion of new products on essential medicine lists or treatment guidelines. So all ways to help ensure more predictable demand. And then also two uh, interventions that, uh, that are listed at the bottom, prizes and product development partnerships that really look at earlier stage um, interventions to generate innovations or, or help bring new health products uh, through to, to market. So trying to cover uh, the range of different ways to balance risks between buyers and suppliers. 
So if we have this range of different types of approaches for doing market shaping, how do we actually implement? And this is probably where the balance really switches more to an art than a science, really thinking about how in you, the specific product market that you're focused on or that's of interest, how do we customize these ideas to meet the, the needs of that market? And here, we don't have any hard and fast rules, and it's not as easy as picking something off a fast food menu as that little chart seems to symbolize. But here are some guiding principles that we have gathered from those practitioners who have engaged in this in the past. Um, we start with collaboration, because over and over we hear how important it is to bring together um, and align the different stakeholders who are in, engaged in the market, even if they do have different types of motivations, and, and some of which may even be intention, but the initial alignment of um, different points of view can be really critical. They can help generate, they can help bring to light all of the relevant data points, and that's important for the analysis for the first two stages of observing shortcomings and diagnosing root causes. They are also critical for actual implementation to make sure that you have the buy-in and the support as you move forward in a complicated process like shaping markets. And then even as you move forward to measuring results, they can help uh, provide data from their different vantage points and, and their different um, teams on the ground. So really, the collaboration is the one that we have led with. But we also wanted to recognize the importance of knowing the trade-offs in the design of an intervention. And so if we think about processes even such as getting more collaborators on board or building consensus, there may be a trade-off that the more time invested in um, bringing that consensus together is actually, it could also create delays in bringing that product to market or bringing that intervention to light. And so recognizing those trade-offs upfront and incorporating them into the design from the beginning is important. Watching for unintended consequences, especially for potential new suppliers or new entrants into the market who may not be there at the outset. And so keeping a broad view and doing some scenario planning to, to try and keep an eye out for unintended consequences since markets are very complex uh, systems. Planning an exit is also important to ensure sustainability. Uh, if we do look at um, interventions that bring information to light or are offering um, new analyses, how are those going to be sustained? Who will be responsible for updating them? What budgets are responsible for making sure that they are current? And so all of these processes, again, if they can be built into the design at the beginning, make the sustainability of the benefits of that intervention much more likely. And then acting soon and adapting, because as soon as we've done the analysis, the market's going to be shifting. And so making sure that we are flexible and nimble to adapt to that as well. And that speaks also to this last step of measuring the results. Because as we've symbolized here, we hope that the disjointed puzzle pieces in different directions that we've started with um, that represent the different types of shortcomings are actually much are operating much more fluidly and, and cohesively by um, the end after we've thought about this market shaping intervention. But we don't want to stop at seeing results just at the market level. We also want to see results on the health level because that's our ultimate goal, is trying to reach that end user. And so the beginning and the end of this pathway are really sort of bookends of thinking about the market characteristics and what we're observing. So again, as I was uh, mentioning at the beginning, our emphasis is on the green interactions and engagements between market actors. But we recognize that without strong organizations that are already operating on the ground and doing the 95% um, the of global health programmatic activities, then without that foundation, then market shaping wouldn't have an opportunity to have its catalytic role and, and its hoped for impact. And so we wanted to point out, just as Wendy had mentioned at the beginning, we're not trying to say that market shaping is going to uh, resolve all access issues or all uptake barriers in every product situation. Most likely, the standard ongoing global health programmatic activities are what's needed. We need to plan for introduction, we need to address scaling barriers, we need to be training healthcare providers, et cetera. But where appropriate, where the analysis and the data tell us there is a root cause that could be addressed by market shaping, then let's take a good look at this tool and see if any of these approaches might be a good fit. 
So with that, that was a rapid fire run through of our market shaping primer. I encourage you to look at the report for more detail on all of these five steps as well as case study examples. Uh, but for today, I think we'll be hearing from a panel that can really tell you about how it can look like on the ground from their direct experiences across the health field. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and it sounds like we're on. So, uh, I was going to just start off with quick rapid fire of some, some examples of market shaping interventions, uh, but I almost want to just skip that. Do you, do you all have, I'm going to give maybe your 10 second, your 30 second, your favorite market intervention impact it's had, and then we're going to dive into a little more, a little, little bit of a little deeper of each one of them and, and as we go along. Dave, you go first. Well, you switched the question on me and picking a favorite wasn't... wasn't okay, it doesn't you can actually, uh, you can pick the one you hate uh, or but no, no, pick, no, pick one. So, I mean, I think the, the, the answer I would give is, is not to be overly attached to mm -hmm. any specific market shaping intervention. Um, you know, different interventions are going to be, and, and some of them quite boring and unexciting, maybe, you know, the, the, the best approach. Um, and I think you have to make sure that the first approach remains the relevant approach or that you adapt your approach over time as market evolves. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about examples yep. where that's relevant. I'm going to go for the advanced market commitment for $10,000. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, you know, again, obviously it really depends on the market problem that you're facing. I think uh, I'm not sure that the vaccine candidate that the advanced market commitment ultimately financed was the ideal product, uh, but they wanted to show proof of concept as quickly as possible. And I think it achieved a shorter time to market and to access than would have been the case under other circumstances. And we can talk about the limitations of the model, um, but it certainly uh, was useful at mobilizing more money uh, for vaccination through this innovative financing mechanism and sort of subsidiarily also uh, impact on price over time. Good, hold that thought, we'll come back to that one. Uh yeah, I don't have a favorite either. Like, I don't have a favorite child, but, um, you know, what I would say is um, over, well, if it's an arm's length uh, uh, supporter of market shaping, less than an implementer, and I think, uh, yeah, we've been involved in many of the, um, of the high profile uh, market shaping interventions over the years. I think what I would say is um, we've seen a big evolution in the knowledge and the capacity that exists in the system to do these interventions. So, you know, if you would compare, for example, the very recent current work uh, led by Gavi on market shaping for an Ebola vaccine to the work that was required to put in place the advanced market commitment for the pneumococcal vaccine, that's, uh, that's very instructive. And equally in family planning, if you were to look at um, the Cyana Press, again, very recent Cyana Press transaction. Um, compared even a couple of years ago to the volume guarantee for the contraceptive implants, you'd see a big, um, a, a big shift. Um, so I'll leave it with that for the moment. Good. Yeah, more to come back to. Yeah, and I think sort of echoing what James said, I think what's interesting to me about market dynamics is the range of interventions and impacts you can have. So from pediatric ARVs, where what we tried to do was lower the price from $600 down to 100, and then create a market where there was virtually none, getting 100,000 children on treatment, I think you contrast that with the work I'll talk about on bed nets, where there was an existing market, but there was opportunity to save hundreds of millions by creating efficiencies versus other markets that we're looking at now for childhood pneumonia treatment, where virtually no kids are on, on treatment, and there is no pricing issue. So I think for me, what's so interesting is the different sort of uh, landscapes you can enter into depending on, on the products and therefore the different interventions you need to, to tailor. Great, and that's a nice segue. Uh, you mentioned, um, uh, antiretroviral. So I'm going to turn to Dave and uh, and put you on the spot a bit. So uh, when we think of market shaping, I think at least I think it's synonymous with chai. You guys have been a real pioneer and, and leader in, in market shaping, and uh, you've done a lot of work to increase affordability of antiretrovirals in HIV sector. Uh, you've also done a lot of work around. Um, 
uh, 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 product access, uh, get, getting at both availability and reliability, uh, or sort of reliable delivery. So c give us a bit more of a, a snapshot of, of the work that you've done there and also how you balanced some of those, um, perhaps uh, those different goals. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, when I talk about our work uh, on ARV access, it's very much an evolution of approach. So the, the approach we took back in 2002 to 2006 um, is quite different and not relevant to problems we face in terms of uh, ARV access today. Um, I, I've, I've heard uh, our organization described in, in one of the, the least attractive terms as essentially being the, the plumbers of the system and looking for where is the pipe clogged, what, what, what's the problem in the system, and, and just doggedly going after that and clearing that that out and then and then figuring out where the next plug that's is. That's a compliment. I think that's awesome. I, I, I take it as such. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if we look, for example, at uh, the, the pediatric ARV market, um, when we when we started working in the space, there were next to no children on treatment. Um, there is not a significant developed uh, uh, high income market for pediatric ARVs, um, and uh, you know today we have over seven hundred fifty thousand children on treatment, and um, you know actually an ironic problem where uh, so many products were developed that the market actually fragmented into a, a larger number of small product sectors than was sustainable. Um, so over the course of that time, obviously, the, the focus went first from uh, uh, working with suppliers and understanding what it would take to get them to invest in developing products, uh, products which are best suited for patients, um, creating the market, and then helping the market organize around the best possible products. And, um, uh, and essentially narrow narrow the selection of products from there. Um, I you know I, I have lots of uh, lots of notes. I mean I, you know I think if even if you look within HIV at the first line market, the second line market, and the pediatric market, you, you have to look very specifically at the details of each market. Um, first line market, for example, was characterized by uh, a leading product which. I, I'm pretty sure this year will overtake uh, Simvastatin as the largest uh, selling generic product globally ever. Um, so you know that's a market with um, huge amount of volume and, and incentive, um, requiring very different type of intervention or, or lack of intervention than uh, a small and, and delicate market like the pediatric market, which someday we hope to eliminate entirely by eliminating pediatric HIV. Great. Well, let me let's switch to vaccines and and. Uh, uh, well, okay, well, actually, I well, wanted to say something yeah, wanna, about this issue. Of, oh no! Please or, do, and I and you guys are encouraged to jump in and and <laughs> yeah. and uh, add to each other's conversation or, or top your, your so points. So please. sometimes the market shaping conversation starts uh, when we already know what product we want to buy. So in the case of bed nets, for example, mm -hmm. we have a number of choices of bed nets. We want to optimize for supply security and for quality and for delivery. But many times we don't know what is the most cost effective product to invest in. And sometimes I worry that we are targeting high cost products in lieu of saying what is the best value for money or even letting cost effectiveness analysis uh, inform our, our price negotiations. So, you know, in, in high income countries, our, our purchasers use economic evaluation, cost effectiveness analysis to find out what is the value, what is the price at which this intervention becomes cost effective. So if we have a disease category we want to address, should we start from there first instead of saying it's the target product, product profile X, Y, or Z? So I think that's something to consider. Um, and the other question, and especially important because we, the primer talks about middle-income countries and the large public purchasers in middle-income countries. And I think to be relevant in those places, we have to look at that. And, and again, it's not just about driving the price down because it could be something very expensive, but that is worth it. So, but we don't know if it's worth it or not in some cases. Um, and we don't know whether it's worth it when we compare it to other possible uses or products that we could be buying. So 
Well, so yeah. can I apply mm -hmm. that to AMCs and uh, with the pneumo vaccine? And we started with a target product profile. Yeah. Uh, but it was a late stage product. So would you? I, I think apply that was that one same? of the issues that it was yeah. so late stage that you know we were close, and there were a couple of manufacturers that were close, and it did give a big premium to the first to market, which is good because that did speed access. Um, but you wonder whether it would have been better to select a product or a TPP for a kind of product that was further up the R&D chain so that the pull really made a big difference. Because I wonder whether a volume guarantee would have been better with the hindsight of ex post, of course. You know, maybe an Ebola vaccine, an AMC actually makes a lot of sense because the science is further upstream. But I'd like to well, but we, uh, I mean, and you know, all the great work by Center for Global Development and Ruth Levine early mm -hmm. on uh, uh, on AMCs, there really mm -hmm. was thinking around both an early stage yeah. AMC and perhaps a later stage AMC. And, and you could argue that we really haven't even tested the AMC on an early stage product yet, which I think was really the better use case. Yeah, and so, but they carry big price tags, which makes yeah, it a little and, tricky. And I think the unfortunate thing is that everyone doesn't want to do AMC because there was a lot of criticism over the price level and things like that. But as you say, I don't think we've really tested the full concept. And I would hope to see, are you doing an AMC for Ebola and Gabby? I'm just curious. Well, yeah, so uh, <laughs> you make a nice segue. I was going to come back to you, but let's go to Ebola. So so we've, you know, we've got, um, we've, we've got a, a new, Disease, not new disease, but a, a new crisis on our hands, and, and potentially an opportunity to use some market shaping tools. What what is the need for market shaping around Ebola vaccines, and what are, what's DFID thinking? Uh, yeah, and not just DFID. Um, so, well, to start with a bit of context, I think um, it was probably two or three months ago that um, the, I think. A, it became clear, and, and particularly um, uh, it's, it's uh, reinforced by the modeling uh, on, on the Ebola outbreak that um, a safe and effective vaccine could have a, a powerful impact, particularly in, um, in ending the outbreak, uh, stamping out the embers, uh, even under the, the, the best case scenarios uh, for, for the outbreak that we all hope for. Um, and I think, yeah, that there was also at the same time strong consensus uh, that uh, we needed to accelerate, uh, really step out of business as usual and uh, accelerate the development of the, of the existing candidate vaccines, uh, of which the two most advanced were only at phase one uh, trials, really um, in normal circumstances, very far from market. So um, the market shaping is not the only challenge here. I think the most significant challenge is the scientific, technical, uh, clinical trials one. And uh, yeah, market shaping um, doesn't necessarily address that. But um, but I would focus on the, the the market shaping aspect. I think what was clear, and uh, uh, I think we were very lucky. We leveraged uh, the existing capacity in Gavi that has been built up over the years. They've um, uh, done a number of transactions, they have the experience, they have a strong team now. And um, yeah, the, the challenge is, is twofold actually. It's a short term and it's a medium term one. I think the short term challenge is to ensure that if the science, uh, the clinical trials is, uh, uh, process is successful, that we're actually in a position where there's available product to be deployed rapidly that mm -hmm. at that point we don't then have to start the production processes and get the financing in place. Um, and so Gavi proposed, their board agreed it last week, they proposed to put in uh, for the short term advanced purchase commitments with the, um, with, with the most advanced manufacturers contingent on the WHO recommending use. But actually then there's the medium term challenge and this is uh, where I think we will want to discuss further and draw on the lessons of, of the AMC. Um, the view is that um, in the medium term, where we'll want to be is uh, having a stockpile of an effective vaccine that can be deployed immediately. There is an outbreak. Uh, we're told that there will be. We're told to expect them. Um, and the analogy, I think, with the AMC is that um, our understanding is the current candidates being trialed aren't necessarily the ones, the, the ones that we want to end up with, mm -hmm. the space to improve them, to get to second generation 
vaccines that cover all of the strains that are more effective, that um, uh, have longer duration. So it's that medium term mechanism, that stockpile mechanism that'll have to build in incentives for um, manufacturers to, 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 to uh, innovate and produce better products. So, Kanika, let me bring you into the conversation. Uh, you've done a lot of work on market shaping tools. One in particular is on the long-lasting insecticide nets. And I think some of the examples we've talked to so far fall probably much more in the, the what people traditionally think about as market shaping. But you've, you've been able to look uh, and apply some market shaping tools in some different ways. So can you tell everybody a little bit about your work there? Yeah, of course. Um, so with, with bed nets, we started this work in 2011. And just to paint the picture at the time, uh, much like pediatric drugs, there, there had been almost a sense there was a little bit of a victim of success in that access had grown tremendously. So from a few million nets, there were 130 million nets being purchased. And there was actually an impending shortfall of 40% in terms of overall funding to reach universal coverage, which was the, the goal at the time. Uh, and so we were asked to look at the marketplace and actually I was saying out of all of the market shaping interventions I've worked with, this hewed most closely to sort of the observe, diagnose, assess, and implement uh, model. We haven't yet measured. But, um, but I came in thinking, oh, we're going to do sort of the same thing that Chai had done and many different products, come in, negotiate, get lower prices, and sort of, you know, say, end of the day. We went in, and actually, it turned out the market had done a really nice job. I mean, the, the prices had fallen. You'd gone from two suppliers down to 10. We did the, the cost of goods sold analysis, and we said, actually, these are not really that large margins. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fair market, and the prices continue to fall. And so we, we still, though, we spoke with different actors in the market, and we found out there were two really important interventions, which together, without even lowering prices, could save over $600 million over five years, which could offer coverage, additional protection on 300 million people. And so one was actually reducing the variance in the marketplace. So there were over 200 different color, shapes, sizes of bed nets. And that doesn't even include labels. We, we heard from suppliers requests for labels with heads of state on them. So, and, um, and when we analyzed it, it turned out that there were some nets, these oversized nets, which cost 20% more per net but resulted in no increased usage on the ground. And so we actually suggested a, a, a best buy list of 70 nets, so still a lot of diversity for countries to choose from, but of nets which really optimized the usage, but also the price. So that simple intervention alone could save $300 million. And the purchasers have, have moved to implement it. It was relatively straightforward. Um, the second, though, was that we found that there was Purchasers were, were buying on lowest price. So it was just a, it was really a bit of a race to the bottom in terms of quality. So you could have a net that cost $3.05 and lasted uh, four years. Uh, and if you um, came in with a net that cost $3 and lasted three years, that $3 net would, you know, essentially win. And so that's a place where we found that it was easy to make the diagnosis and the assessment but there was actually no way of knowing how long nets have lasted. So that's a whole long, long story, but we've been working on that and implementing that recommendation, figuring out how long nets last in the field has been sort of a, a two-year labor of love, which we're still working on very closely with PMI and Global Fund and the textiles industry, in fact. Um, but but um, yeah, that's where we're heading, and, and we're hoping it not only spurs price savings, but also innovation. Manufacturers are saying, if quality matters, well, that's what I'm gonna invest in. I'm gonna make a better net, and so we're seeing a lot of investment in innovation. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, great examples on the implementation side. And, and you mentioned that you also did do some of that root cause analysis as Absolutely. well. Maybe you've asked others in the, the panel here, we talk a lot about the importance of, of understanding uh, and diagnosing uh, the, the market inefficiency and understanding those root causes. And, and that uh, lab that a number of you participated in that was one of the big, my big takeaways is everyone seemed to really emphasize how important it was to understand those root causes. It's not enough just to observe these market shortcomings. But I'm curious, as, as you've put some of these tools into practice, um, how much have you actually done that? Uh, how critically important do you think that is? Um, uh, have you been lucky and gotten it right a few times? And um, James, I know that you have you talked a little bit about uh, if you've applied it well on the Cyana Press work, and, and uh, but I'm you know, I'm maybe hear from a few others, hear from you and a few others as to whether or not this is a critical step. 
Um, yeah, well, I mentioned Cyanopress. So Cyanopress, um, I mentioned at the beginning, was a very recent announcement that uh, Cyanopress, which is um, uh, it's a new formulation of a uh, very popular three-month uh, injectable contraceptive, Depo Provera, um, and it's, it's new in the sense it's pre-filled, it's easier to use, offers great potential. Um, uh, it, it's um, not widely used at the moment, the, the Cyanopress. Um, and uh, we'd been in pilot mode, I think, for, for a while. Um, and I think there was a general consensus that uh, that pilot mode, the prices of the pilot mode weren't going to be enough to kickstart demand. We weren't going to be able to test demand. Um, because the prices were too high, and, and actually a risk that uh, those volumes weren't uh, large enough that to, to, to keep the manufacturers, only one manufacturer at the moment, to keep them in the market. So um, I think that was the foundation for that. That's uh, the observed market shortcomings. I think that was the foundation for, for um, yeah, rigorous root cause analysis, not undertaken by me, but um, by. Um, by uh, yeah, a number of un other partners, um, and, and as I say, that that's the kind of expertise that I think is exists in the system among you know Alpha D, Chai, uh, other other actors that we didn't have previously. Yeah, where we ended up with with that uh, was uh, the, uh, the the dollar per unit announcement, um, and I think yeah, it, it was certainly the case that the choice of intervention uh, arose out of that bottom up. Analysis, uh, it's not a volume guarantee because uh, we're too early in the rollout to be secure enough, to be confident enough in volumes to be able to guarantee them. That's too risky to step back from that. It's a volume based pricing model, a sort of subsidy essentially, where um, uh, the subsidies are higher at lower volumes and they start declining uh, as volumes increase and as the, uh, as the economics for the manufacturer uh, get more attractive. So. Um, so yeah, that, I, I certainly think that um, you know we're evolving to do a better job on this root cause analysis, and uh, yeah, I would hope that the quality of the interventions are, are better for that too. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, no, I just um, I think one issue is that there could be more work on the economics of market shaping. You know, there are standard ways to measure competition in markets that I actually haven't seen analytically. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of academic articles in this space in the major global health product markets because I think that would help us to understand really what the relationship is with price and competition over time and this supply security issue. What we've seen is we've had experiences, right? I mean, we, we have the UNICEF supply division experience with measles. So certainly payers went to a market and had that experience. But at the same time, high income governments were, were purchasing those things. I mean, other purchasers were buying. So I wonder if we shouldn't think also about an economics of market shaping effort to really understand whether we're getting more competition with these mechanisms. Are we really getting more, better prices? Looking at all the purchasers in the landscape, because we in global health are just one piece of the pie. There's a whole world out there buying too. Not, not the case for maybe pediatric ARVs, but for many of these other products there are. Sounds like a great line of work for CGD. <laughs> yeah, I know. Take I'm just a little that yeah, <laughs> Later. No, and uh, I mean, I would argue that one of the uh, reasons that the ARV marketplace has been successful is that uh, we have a, a relatively high number of influential buyers who use different approaches um, who are who are playing in the market. You don't have a monopsony mm -hmm. uh, where uh, you have a single approach by a, a single actor. Um, I, mean, I, I think. It, you know, looking at the flip side, I think Chai has a, a reputation for um, focusing more on the immediacy of the the need for a health response and using market shaping as a, a tool. And so, you know, I think we we I, I'll give an example of something where we we kind of followed this progression, um, and I think it was important. But I, I think we also. You know, and I, I personally very much think at some point um, you have to analyze to an extent, come up with a theory, but then you have to start testing, trying things, seeing what the, what the reaction is, and uh, allowing allowing the intervention to evolve rather than 
standing back and waiting to design a perfect intervention um, and then implement it if that's going to take longer. Now, um, to immediately contradict myself, um, <laughs> you know, in, 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 the, in the case of ARVs, um, you know, what, one product that we, we looked at as an example is tenofovir. It's, uh, it's one of the newer HIV treatments. It's used in first-line treatment. It's got fewer side effects than some of the older first-line treatments. But at the time it was introduced into the market, it was significantly more expensive. So you have a better product, more expensive, um, uh, based on usage in, in uh, programs which were not cost sensitive, uh, such as the US. It was pretty clear what the uh, product preferences were. Um, we spent a, a, a good deal of time understanding what the underlying costs to making that product were and identified inefficiencies, which we then made investments in R&D, worked with suppliers to, to fix, and um, really focused on driving down the price of tenofovir. Um, you know, this, this, that isn't a tool you could just pick a drug and apply it. You have to, um, you know, that was a case where we identified a drug that, that was the preferred product. We figured out why it was uh, inaccessible from a cost perspective and set out to solve that specific Problem. So, um, you know, there's a case where picking the right intervention on the right product was really important. If we had just, uh, you know, started going after, uh, you know, anything that that was already out there and in, in large use in the market, um, we probably would have gone in the wrong direction. Can I come yeah. in on, on this? Please, go ahead. And just to build on on Dave's point, I also think that we focus a lot on the big mechanisms, the AMCs, the Unitaid. And we were just talking this morning, and I was reminded of an example from my Thai days where we collapsed a lot of these steps into one. And, and well, actually, there were two related examples. One was around diagnostics for both adult and pediatric HIV AIDS drugs. When we would go into countries, a lot of times CD4 machines would be broken. And you know, half of them, and I think at one point, I don't know, one country in East Africa, which I won't call out, I think at one point, like 85% of something of the machines were broken. And so we tried to understand why that was, and it was because countries, it was easier for them to budget for the machines and the equipment, and that was what was in their global fund applications, but the, the maintenance was not, the repair was not. And so we ended up going to the manufacturers and saying, can you create a bundled price? So for a couple of pennies more, include maintenance. And that was something that was hugely successful. It wasn't a big mechanism, but it was something that had you know, massive impact. And then relatedly around the design point, because I do think we focus a lot on affordability, frankly, um, with early infant diagnoses. We'd spent so much time building these sophisticated sample networks, putting in these expensive machines into central labs, because it's very complex to do the infant diagnoses, uh, setting up sample transport, training lab workers, buying the products, you know, buying the, the testing equipment. And then I remember going into a lab in Lusaka and, you know, so proud, like, oh, is this, you know, everything's running, How, how's it going? And they're like, yeah, we haven't run a single test. And it turned out they were missing a vial and there are 26 products that they need to be able to successfully run a test. So we went back to Roche and we created an early infant diagnosis, diagnostic bundle, no price savings. But in terms of access, it was a huge win and it became one of their, I think one of their biggest sellers in sort of this, this product line. And so I just wanna emphasize that I think we focus a lot on these really complex interventions, but sometimes these very simple market interventions have huge impact on, on access. Great. So I want to squeeze in two more topics before we open it up to, to the audience, but you all get ready out there. Um, so one has to do with the time-bound nature of some of these market-shaping interventions. And, uh, and Amy had talked uh, uh, earlier about the importance of really thinking through what your exit is. And, uh, and some of these interventions, some, some seem to better think through the exit than others. Um, whether or not that's a problem, maybe will remain to, remains to be seen. At AMCs, there was a lot of thought about that exit, uh, understanding, uh, uh, making sure that suppliers got their upfront uh, uh, ability to recoup their costs, and then they built in a long-term tail price so you could ensure that the that even once they got their costs up front, you could they would still be able to stay in the game with a. a Okay, well, a longer term, um, uh, a lower price uh, um, that, that went years out. Things like volume guarantees, they see they have, they're set for a certain number of years and then there's a clear drop off. So have, how have you guys thought about the, 
you know, trying to think about the time-bound nature of some of these. Is it, is it some, is something to worry about? Is it something that we need to think about uh, when designing these interventions? Have you run into any trouble uh, if you haven't thought it through? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely critical, and I'll give an example of a program where, uh, you know, I think we, we, we had a simplistic view on, on how the exit would work, and it was really a lot more challenging. That was the Unitaid-funded pediatric program, where um, the, the design of the program was uh, to create a market by um, uh, setting aside a, a, a large amount of purchasing dollars to procure and donate product at the beginning of the market phase. Um, you know, we, we ran into an exceptionally long transition out of that program because we hadn't um, adequately worked with um, the funders who were going to pick up the funding of these products, which uh, you know, during the program, we're, we're hitting the books for free uh, in, in country programs. So no one had a line item for procuring pediatric ARVs, you know, even if it was e even a small number that was going to grow to a large number. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely critical that um, you, you have a plan. Um, uh, you know, I also, I, I think we've learned uh, over time that uh, very few plans actually uh, end up uh, have un unfolding the way way you have it originally planned, and um, but I think transition is uh, an exceptionally critical design element from the start. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, well, just briefly, <laughs> um, you know, I think ultimately you're, you're trying to get to a market state where where no intervention is required. But just to comment um, related to the the, the, the Cyan and Press example I use, I think the uh, it's it's clear that uh, when we reach the end of the, uh, of the current intervention that I described, the, um, uh, the dollar per unit agreement, that uh, we won't have reached market sustainability. Uh, we're too early in the, in the rollout process. We don't know what the right intervention will be uh, when that time comes, but uh, certainly I, I think there's an understanding that, that, that we can't walk away. So. Um, and I think there's this sense of different interventions being required at different stages of the of, of the introduction chain. You know, if you're if you're very upstream and thinking of product introduction, you might want one thing. Um, if you're further downstream, you need another. But uh, yeah, your your intervention needs to, uh, to needs to respond to the stage you are uh, in the value chain. So. Did you, okay, so let me just ask you, um, big opportunities on the horizon. Where, where, where will we see market shaping in the next uh, few years? What are, the, what are the things we should be looking at? Where, what are the opportunities, um, maybe in the short term, perhaps even some bigger opportunities in the longer term? And, and, and if any of you wants to actually turn it into an advice for the U.S. government on where we should be engaging, feel free. Who wants to go first? Kanika? I'll, I'll talk about a couple of products, and then I'll talk about sectors. And I'm sure there are others on this panel who can build on that a lot, or choose not to if they don't want to do more sectors. <laughs> um, but the, um, in terms of products, I, we're starting to look at uh, amoxicillin. And I'm going to use this as an example of something which we were even talking about internally, and it'll be great to, to hear from the group on whether this counts as market shaping or not, or does it really not matter. Um, amoxicillin is used to treat childhood pneumonia. Uh, it kills childhood pneumonia is the biggest infectious disease killer of children, more so than HIV, TB, and malaria combined, is my understanding. And um, and there's a there's a product which costs 30 cents WHO recommended versus $100 for pediatric ARVs, which we've all per year, which we've all spent so much effort on scaling, rightfully so. But um, but when we looked at this market at, at R4D just a, a couple years back, there was less than one percent of kids on treatment, and so. That's an issue where, as we've looked at it, it's not an affordability issue. It doesn't seem to be a capacity issue. It's a little bit of a funding issue, but the whole market is $10 million, right, versus more than half a billion dollar, or half a, mil, uh, half a billion for, for bed nets per year. And, um, and it's turned out to be very much a local issue. I mean, it's a combination of EML, you know, it's getting it on the guidelines, it's getting it registered, it's frankly getting the governments and the partners to care about it because it's not supported by big financiers. And so, our, our team actually has a program which we are using to start working in countries to address some of those barriers. 
But frankly, as I look at the horizon, a lot of the products that we're thinking about, whether it's chlorhexidine, whether it's, you know, there are pro products where there's not a pricing issue necessarily, which is how we've led with a lot of previous market debt shaping interventions. It's frankly mostly a country level issue, but we still need a liaison across the market. We still need to be talking to suppliers about capacity. We still need to be talking about global financiers about the funding. And then we need to be getting in countries. And it's funny because we did this with all of these really expensive products to get access, work on the demand and supply side, but we haven't done it with these others. So, so I think there's a question on this local, what we call local market shaping or what have you. How do we intervene in these other product areas? Um, and then the second is just sort of broadly, where, where I think we're collectively sort of talking about this has worked really well in health, but this isn't, you know, the, the, is there a role for market shaping in other sectors? And I think, I'm on the, you know, we've looked at nutrition and I think there's a lot of political sensitivities around nutrition. There's no centralized buyer. Does it work as effectively? I don't know, it's an open question. Ag is another area. So, you know, education, I know they're starting to look at that. So I think there's a question of, and I don't think the answer is, is a foregone conclusion, yes, by any means, but I think it's an interesting, thought to look at are there other sectors so Amanda you want to yeah, I just wanted to say I mean that's what I mean by do we are we buying the most no, cost I understand. effective I understand. are yeah. we pri setting priorities if we in global health are focused on the high price thing and meanwhile a country isn't buying amoxicillin with their own money there's something really wrong with what we're doing right now and so I think we need to think about uh, supporting priority setting in the countries for and, and linking with the payers and I think that's the great advantage to market you, you're thinking about the purchaser who's buying the product and the payer is also the one in the developing country that needs to think about what's the most cost effective buy, what kind of product they're going to buy. They're, you know, the, the banks, the World Bank and the other banks have been giving money for a long time to procure medicines. And I would love to take a look at what that looks like and whether that those purchases represent good market shaping decisions or not, and where there could be gains. So I think that would be something quite interesting that you could do. They, they must have that information. I don't know if it's in an easy place, um, but it would be helpful because that, that would show what countries themselves are purchasing generally for primary health care programs. So you would be able to see what the problems have been in the past. And quickly, James or Dave? Um, yeah, quickly. Um, well, I mentioned uh, Ebola vaccine. You know, I think it's been uh, very helpful to be able to leverage the um, stock of knowledge and capacity for that. And then thinking beyond the lessons from Ebola, global health security, how do we um, deploy um, in a helpful manner uh, the, the, the techniques and capacity and market dynamics to actually get ahead, further ahead than we were on Ebola in terms of um, other threats that might be identified and the technologies that will be needed for that. Um, and then just to echo uh, some of the, uh, the, the things that Kanika said about other sectors, you know, really interesting work on uh, education and books, um, nutrition, climate change, low cost solar, these kinds of things are things that we're very keen to explore, but we recognize that they're all very different and will require different challenges. Dave? Uh, I'll, I'll start with an answer that Amanda will hate, um, but, uh, <laughs> but one which will bankrupt health programs if we don't address, and that's hepatitis C treatment. Um, I like hepatitis C. It doesn't but, matter. But it's I'm very <laughs> expensive. It's very <laughs> expensive. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, focus, taking a step back and not just focusing on the price of the thing we buy, but looking at the price for the health outcome we're exactly. actually achieving exactly. uh, is really important. I mean, uh, you know, on bed nets, we're getting great value buying bed nets if we distribute half of them to households that are not in malaria transmitting regions. We're getting half the value we we think we are. Um, involvement of middle income countries and uh, countries outside of the large donors. We we recently did an agreement on uh, uh, viral load test pricing it was led by South Africa, who are the largest purchasers of this product worldwide. 60% of all viral loads run globally or run in South Africa. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a case where the middle income program did the math. They recognized that this is a cost-effective intervention led the way, and I think we need to um, as a global community, figure out how 
we can work with um, those large middle income markets to um, shape the market uh, without large donor support. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, vaccines are always uh, cost effective. I, I think as we start to look towards um, uh, 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 NCDs, non-communicable diseases, um, I mean, there are, there are a few um, uh, very expensive NCDs which are caused by vaccine-preventable conditions, hepatitis B, um, uh, HPV. So, um, you know, I think a focus on vaccinations uh, which, uh, which prolong, prolong life towards, uh, towards the later years are going to be quite important as well. Thank you. All right, well, let's uh, open it up to the audience. You have a great uh, set of experts up here. So uh, bring on the questions. Yes, up front. And do we have mics? Excellent. Hi, I'm Judith Rius. I work for the Access Campaign of Doctors Without Borders. So for I'm sure uh, people are familiar with Doctors Without Borders, my baby, not so much with the Access Campaign. <laughs> the Access Campaign is a small team um, uh, a multidisciplinary team uh, working all around the world. I work here in, in the United States. Um, we were created in 1999, uh, and really the way I see our work is really within the scope of, of your work, also of your report, as a market shaping think tank within a medical humanitarian organization. Uh, our mandate really was to reduce the price of medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics, uh, and to incentivize innovation when it doesn't exist and really came up to the frustration of our medical teams working right now around 70 countries around the world that didn't have the tools and don't still have the tools to treat and prevent and diagnose the diseases that we want. So we've been working on market shaping now for since 1999, I don't know, maybe more than 20 years. Um, and we've learned a lot, of course, from that experience. Um, one of the main lessons that we have learned is the importance of empowering governments and civil society at the local level uh, to be the market shapers uh, and to be the deciders of any market shaping intervention. So I, that was my first, I have many points on this report. Mm -hmm. So that was my first point. How have you, I mean, I've seen the list of consultants, but how, how do you see the role of middle income economies and low income economies, governments and civil society in shaping markets and creating sustainable solutions for access and for innovation? Um, then, um, the, you know, I, I, I do think it's very important the work of trying to create what I understand this report is about is a pathway to really, and, and kind of a, a systematic way of thinking about these questions and these issues, um, and kind of set up a framework that could inform the work of the US government, but also, of course, the potential effect of this report is broader. It could inform the work of governments and civil society and stakeholders all around the world by listing um, barriers and potential solutions and strategies for shaping. So, it's very important what's in the report, but it's equally important what it's not in the report. So one of the things that I think it's missing in the report and that it's very important is, uh, because it's one of the lessons that we learned for more than 20 years, is the importance of competition in the marketplace. Uh, I mean, the report vaguely mentions HIV AIDS. Uh, it mentions Second Line and the, the, the great work that Chai has been doing on Second Line. I'm very glad David mentioned the Nothovir. Uh, but the report has no reference at all on the use of tools that have been used and are being used right now to promote competition. Uh, it's a report that it's written in 2014. Therefore, we should be recognizing since, that since 2005, the world has changed. There is now uh, intellectual property norms, uh, patents, and others, and that protect uh, the manufacturing and the distribution of these technologies. So a report on market shaping should address that issue up front and provide tools for governments and readers um, that are trying to create market shaping strategies at the national and at the global level. So why there is no mention in the report of intellectual property barriers and strategies to promote competition that have been essential on the first line for HIV AIDS and are in fact essential for the second line for HIV AIDS and are essential for many other um, medicines and vaccines, the diagnostics that we're trying to access in the developing countries. So for example, hepatitis C. Why there is no mention of patent oppositions, compulsory license, voluntary license. And my second and last question. That okay. Of course, <laughs> last, 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 Why don't last we question. stop with that one for a second because I want to bring other ones, others into Just the... One, one last point. I'm sorry. Yeah, is one report, sentence. Okay, one sentence. The report really makes a, a very important point of, about the importance of upsetting financial risk to suppliers and donors and purchasers. 
And, and it makes very specific recommendations. And I think this is really interesting, but it really focuses on recommendations that will mostly benefit US and European pharmaceutical companies. There's really not much there that will strengthen the purchasing power of governments um, and the information asymmetries that many governments right now have. So I was just wondering, how did you uh, consider including or not including that kind of information? So thank you, Judith, and I, I, a lot of actually great feedback and, and lots of things to digest. I saw a couple other hands, so let me just take, um, and that was a lot for us to also react to, but let me just take at least one more and then we'll, um, then we'll get some responses and we'll take some more questions. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Raman with the Futures Group. Um, I was really interested in your comments, Kanika, about local market shaping. In terms of favorite uh, market shaping interventions, mine is demand generation. And at the user level, in the diagram that was up, where the person is in the center and the actors are around the periphery, none of those lines led to the person. So commenting on perhaps what are some things that you think work for demand generation at the user level rather than the payer level or at the global level, uh, and that recognizing the microdynamics of country level markets. Great. Thanks. Okay, so we have a number of things, and I, I think we did have an open conversation on, on each of these things. So we've got uh, questions around role of low-income countries in civil society, uh, importance of competition, which I think um, many of us all would agree is, is extremely important, and, and I, I think with that is around uh, addressing IP, and then strengthening purchasing power. Uh, and then last, we've got demand generation at the user level. So who wants to jump in on any of those? Can I say something about the demand generation? Because I think um, it's very important to recognize that many of these markets are predominantly private markets. We think about ourselves as a big public payer, and that is actually not the world. That's one part of the world. And that therefore, if we want more accessible prices of commonly used medications or devices, we have to think about those private sector purchasers, whether they're households, whether they're pharmacists, or et cetera. And I think you know there's a lot of work do, being done in this area in terms of you know, there's social marketing kinds of things, there are more regulatory interventions, all those things are worth uh, looking at further. And, and that's the issue of whether market shaping is the right term for all those things, right? Maybe we should just be saying, I'm a public purchaser, I'm a global health purchaser, and that is my focus here. I'm talking about how to purchase better. And related to that, I'd say, you know, we need to maybe think of partnerships between these purchasers or payers that have to learn how to negotiate with the different players in the market and to learn how to understand those markets and what's out there, what leverage they have to get new kinds of products, how they could associate or not associate. Um, and I guess you know, competition is important, but I, I also think this value for money concept is really important too, right? I mean, if there's something, if hep C is worth it in terms of disease burden averted at some price, let's know that price and start the discussion there, right? That, and that would, you know, that would, that also gives policymakers a place to start to. Thanks. So just on the, sort of building on the demand generation point, I'm by no, I don't know nearly as much about demand generation as I should in market shaping. And I think this is where, I, I do fundamentally think that there, um, we need to understand more about the patient and their flow and their needs, how they come to the clinic, how they don't get results from the clinic. I mean, we always talk about all the successes. I think it's important to recognize the failures. In the pediatrics program, which I was very involved with, so, so I'm owning this failure, we found at the end of the year when we started this program with, at CHAI that one out of every two patients who tested positive were actually not on ARVs by the end of the year. So we had done all the work of getting the drugs in country, training the healthcare providers, but it turned out that there were all of these drop-offs where you know some patients wouldn't come to get the results back because it took a month to get them back. Some of them would get the results, but it meant that they had to go to a clinic to get initiated and they weren't making. So there were, there were three, and then some of them got on treatment and didn't stay on treatment. And that was something, you know, it's really hard programmatic work. And this is also where sort of market shaping meets a lot of the program work. Mm -hmm. But that was something where I felt like we could have thought a lot about design. I know, um, actually, CII is doing a lot of work on uh, human-centered design and understanding what are the right products. I mean, they've done great work on, you know, finding better protective clothing for Ebola patients. Well, how do we take that to scale? How do we take some of these other innovations to scale? So I think there's a lot more that we need to do 
to whether it's on the product side or on the demand generation side to really understand the patient and I think and, and marry some of those micro questions to the big macro things we're looking at. I'd like to maybe answer some of the first or address some of the first questions. I don't, I don't know that I can answer them. And then I have a, a comment on uh, demand generation at the end. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons that uh, if you look at where we've been successful in first line ARV market, it's because um, there, there is a robust amount of competition. And it's not, not just on the supply side, but also on the buyer side. Um, and, and that's because there are uh, quite a few um, low and middle income buyers in the market who play significant roles there. Um, I'm, I'm very much a believer in, uh, in competition on both sides. And I, I, you know, I, I think uh, in the market shaping work, we talk a lot about the importance of collaboration and working together. Um, you know, I think there's all, it's also important to make each other uncomfortable and make sure that we are pushing each other hard enough um, on the the demand side of the the market. So you know, to me, competition with suppliers absolutely, um, but uh, with, among buyers as well, I think is very important. Um, uh, you know, I I have uh, I, I think there are several examples of market shaping interventions which have supported the entry of suppliers in lower middle income countries, um, in, including uh, some work on pendivalent vaccine where a new uh, Indian supplier came into the market at a, a lower price. Um, uh, we, we actually see a lot of innovation amongst the Indian generic ARV manufacturers. It may not be the innovation that we're, we're used to labeling as such in, in the West, but um, you know, and there, there are quite a number of market shaping approaches we can take to um, make sure that those companies continue to uh, be aggressively innovative. So I, you know, I, I agree with you. That's really important. On, on creating demand, I mean, you know, I think to some extent the, the, it becomes more a debate about do you label it market shaping or a program work. But I think it's important nonetheless. And. One example is we have a, uh, a program looking at the use of zinc and ORS treatment for, for diarrhea. Um, in, in India, um, I, I think it's six, it depends on the state, but over 60% of patients are going into the private sector. We did a lot of work looking at is it social marketing that's the right approach. We, we ended up determining that um, first off, those patients aren't in cities. They're in rural, small towns and their treatment decisions are influenced by the rural medical providers in that town. Um, so you know, our response was to create essentially a, a pharma detailing sales force, which goes and, address, and interacts with these health providers who haven't been detailed to before. Now, you, know, you, you could debate, is that a, a, an implementation program or is it creating a, a large um, uh, network of private suppliers who now have leverage to change the market. You know, I, I think that's that's more of a, uh, a, a debate about uh, what we what we label things. But um, you know, I, I I think there are different ways to go about it than than just focusing on the large public uh, uh, procurers in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that example because I was going to make Joe stand up and, and talk about that since you've been partnering with Chai on, on that issue. But let's bring a few more questions in. So we had one in the back, and then we've got two in the front, and maybe one. All right, let's try to get four on the table, see if we can keep track of all of those. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Camilla from WSU at the Office of Education. And we would like to thank you and all of our colleagues in the health sector for all of the work that you've done on this, because we're learning a tremendous amount as we look at developing a kind of market shaping intervention around the books and learning materials uh, subsector. And I'm really interested, I would love to hear more about these issues of local suppliers, regional suppliers, international suppliers, the tensions and the way that that's played out. And if you have any advice for us, things that, you know, if you had known then what you know now that you might have done differently when you had started out. Thank you. Great. All right, we had two up front and one back here. Hello. 
Hi, my name is Reem, and I work with Management Sciences for Health on pharmaceutical supply chain management. And my question was specifically about one of the options. Um, during your presentation, you talked about um, different ways to assess the options, and one of them was strategic demand forecasting. I just wanted to know more about what kind of questions you're supposed to, or you would recommend to ask countries or other stakeholders in order to get a precise um, outlook on what that strategic forecast, demand forecast would look like. Great. Uh, my name is Rolf Malpani. I work as the Director of Policy for Medicines on Frontiers Access Campaign. Broadly speaking, the, the concern I have with the report is it takes market shaping as an issue which we think is deeply political and it seems to reduce it to one that's only technical. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps reflects why issues around governments and civil society are not reflected in the report. And the entire history of ensuring access to medicines has been a deeply political response, including bringing down the cost of many drugs over the last 15 years. And in a sense, this report erases that role that civil society and governments have played. Mm. What I wanted to talk about were five threats that we see today and to hear responses from the panel around some of these threats. The first is around the higher cost of drugs and vaccines in middle-income countries. And the fact, especially in countries that are being now labeled as middle or upper middle-income countries are now seeing unsustainable prices for products. And Hepatitis C is certainly a good example in which we're seeing very high prices potentially in those countries in which governments and households are going to be una unable to pay. And for our organization, we now work in 35 middle income countries and we're finding a very hard time now scaling up uh, access to treatment. Uh, a second threat we see is uh, the onset of monopsonies to come back to David's point and certainly we see at the Global Fund that some of the harmonization it's doing around demand forecasting and buying uh, potentially uh, sort of disrupts the disruption that you would prefer to have in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. A third is certainly about increased intellectual property barriers, and to emphasize with tenofovir, it was a successful pre-grant opposition in India on tenofovir that first brought generic manufacturers into the marketplace, and we recognize the role that Chai has played, but without that pre-grant opposition, actually, you would not have had the robust competition. Today, the United States government is negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will introduce the highest levels of protection in history in, across the Asia-Pacific region, and is also putting substantial pressure on the government of India to introduce higher levels of intellectual property protection. A fourth issue that I'd just like to highlight is around uh, the return to donations, and certainly the recent announcement by USAID with Janssen is a concern for us because we don't think donations are ever sustainable for healthcare programs. And instead of providing a sustainable price for bedaquilin, uh, we're seeing a four-year donation program, whereas a lot of civil society organizations had asked for a sustainable price for low- and middle-income countries. And the fifth, very quickly, is to note uh, a program that Gilead Sciences would like to introduce for its new hepatitis C drugs, which is an anti-diversion program to be introduced in all low and middle income countries that would restrict uh, retail sales of their drugs in, in outlets that would require patients to submit to viral load testing. And to the extent that viral load is not going down, they would not be able to continue treatment. If patients lose their drugs, they may not be able to continue treatment. And this is all, uh, it require uh, identification cards. And for many of the people which MSF treats, they are people who do not have identification. And all of this is predicated on the fact happen. that we see different prices in high and low income markets that therefore will deny access to many patients and violate patient ethics. So I'd like to hear about some of these threats and not simply about opportunities because we see many threats today. Okay, great. We had one last one we're gonna squeeze in. Hi, um, my name is Lisa from the William Davidson Institute. I had a few comments and then a question at the end, um, and I'll be quick. Uh, one of the comments was about competition. Um, I think I would just like to add to the conversation that competition may be something that's more dynamic to consider in specific markets. Um, from our experience in some of the active pharmaceutical ingredient markets and looking at some of the MDRTB molecules, more than one manufacturer in a specific market that has relatively small demand and has been around and doesn't have the same patent protections that some of the newer products has, may not be necessary to have the same degree of competition that may fragment the market, that may disincentivize certain manufacturers from remaining engaged. So just to add the caveat that I think competition is something that needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's important to go through that understanding of each specific product market to understand what might be required. Um, one of the other things was, um, I was glad to hear the discussion of ORS and zinc and the role of the private sector. I guess the question that I had was related to that with regard to um, doing that priming at a pharmacy level outside of the education, is there 
further being done to incentivize, like from a market perspective, if there is some type of, because part, part of the problem in the ORS and zinc market is the low margin mm -hmm. and that people are wanting antibiotics usually. And so how do you make ORS and zinc a replacement for antibiotics in a lot of cases? Um, and so is there a push mechanism from, from a supplier standpoint? Um, and then the other thing was with regard to cost effectiveness. I think, again, I would just suggest perhaps a more dynamic conversation around traditional cost effectiveness analysis to think about qualities as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we're thinking about in MDRTB again, um, because many of the drugs that are available are extremely toxic to the patient. And so our understanding of what an ideal drug regimen might be varied in terms of cost based on also what the adverse events are and how that's impacting treatment outcomes, how that's impacting adherence to mm -hmm. treatment, mm -hmm. other elements like that. So it can be a very dynamic conversation. Um, and so outside of just looking at something like DALIs that's traditionally used in a cost effectiveness mm -hmm. analysis, looking at something like qualities as well. Great. And I, that's a good reminder to give a, a big nod to the William Davidson Institute and, and Prashant Yadev and his team for some of the early work on, on this primer as well. So lots of fingerprints on this and, and engagement. All right, so we have a big list. Uh, we're not going to get to all of it, um, but maybe if you can just pick and choose a couple to tackle. And we also have uh, cookies for uh, people to swarm <laughs> everybody afterwards. Um, <laughs> So we've got advice for education, uh, tensions, local, uh, regional, international suppliers. We've got MSH, uh, ways, um, uh, advice on optimizing uh, strategic demand forecasting, um, uh, MSF uh, with a lot of, of uh, really good food for thought, um, but also getting at sort of the political versus Technical and and I'd I'd love your thoughts on uh, because you know clearly there's there's an important role for civil society and local governments in these pieces and 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 so so how do we how do we think and weave that into some of the technical thinking here and then finally you had a whole bunch in there from competition to cost effectiveness and use of qualities uh, so pick and choose. I'll take. Uh, that was kind of the easy that, one. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the MSF questions for, for Dave. Dave. <laughs> 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 the, uh, with local, regional, uh, international suppliers, which I would say that some of the primers we think about in, obviously we want to create a diverse competitive market, but some of the factors as to how much we encourage versus local versus let's say international, Primers are quality. Can it be produced in a quality way in country? Um, some products are easy to produce in high quality way in country. Others, oftentimes, international suppliers are a little bit better placed. Price, uh, can it be pr uh, priced competitively? And then just what are the political dimensions? So to give you three very quick examples of different products, ARVs, we found that given the massive economies of scale and the relative sophistication needed, oftentimes that's a product. Okay. Thank you. Um, oftentimes that's a. Is it on? Yes, um, the product that's mess, best placed to produce internationally, just huge savings. Governments tend to be receptive. They, they understand for, for whatever reason that pharmaceuticals oftentimes are better placed overseas. Amoxicillin DT, that's a cheap product. We're still doing the market analysis, but our feeling is that's probably a product that can be produced in a high quality way in country. They're small they're, they're in, and at affordable price and generally strong political will. Um, and then there's if still a, an example that Dave and I were just talking about earlier, Oftentimes with food products, nutrition products, milk powder he was talking about, it's harder to get those imported. There's a lot of political will to produce that in country and strong support for domestic industry. So even if there were strong economies, even if there were potentially quality issues, that, that's a product which I think we would potentially look a little bit more, inter more nationally. So just to say there, are, I don't think there's one easy answer, but those are just at least a couple of the dimensions that I've seen considered as you decide what's the right balance of, of international and, and national suppliers. Great. Who wants to take another one? Okay. Do you want to go for yeah, it, go ahead. Amanda? Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, certainly there's a lot of funny things happening in middle income countries. Uh, there's a lot of diversity of experience. Some purchase payers and purchasers are more. Uh, able to get better prices than others. So I think part of it's also, first I think it is, I'm sorry to harp on about this, but I think it has to do with setting priorities and understanding what's cost effective and the price at which something is cost effective. I think it's 
uh, knowing how to negotiate and how to purchase. And there's very little exchange. And they should be talking to the purchaser at Kaiser Permanente and United Healthcare and the UK NHS and not talking to us, actually. I don't think that we have experienced what it means to negotiate well. And I, that's why I'm suggesting we look at the World Bank's funded purchasing mechanisms to see what's happened. Are they getting the best prices that they possibly can? But the other issue is this issue of like reference pricing versus tiered pricing versus value-based pricing. These are very complex issues that require some empirical analysis and some theoretical analysis in a more rigorous way in the public domain. Um, and so I hope that somebody does that soon. <laughs> um, you know, because we, and it is a very political process. No, I don't think anybody doubts that. And I mean, when I, I the ARV price went down, like how much is something fancy market shaping and how much is it that Bill Clinton called up or whoever it was, you tell us and said, hey, will you do us, us a favor? It's really important. I don't know. I mean, there, there's clearly in civil society pressure and the act of the South Africa and all that. So anyhow, um, so yes, answer is yes. On demand forecasting, I wanted to say um, you need better utilization data of how medications are being used to understand what the, 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 the situation is in the following year. And even on something simple like vaccines, we haven't been measuring wastage symptomatic, uh, systematically. So I understand that that's happening now. And, and there, we, at CGD, we ran a working group on demand forecasting that lays out some of the aspects of this. But of course, Unitaid and Gavi and others have advanced much more on this uh, together with country governments. So that's worth doing more research on. On, um, you asked about what are mechanisms, and I'm sure you set me up for this, but what about the AMFM, right? Not mentioned, evaluated better than almost any other one of these mechanisms, positive impact, and killed, right? So I guess I wonder, you know, is, why is that? Because we felt like that was not a good way to shape the market. Um, I never understood very well what the objection was to it, um, and it would just be interesting to hear. On qualies, absolutely, absolutely. So, and I, but who wants to call up Chris Murray and tell him, right? Because are we going to switch to qualies and burden of disease? <laughs> that so, one's all, all right, so we're five minutes over. <laughs> just really quick, yes, we are, right? Um, so just quick comments or last thoughts. And then we can continue over coffee and cookies. Are we on last thoughts? We're not answering. Well, you can answer or give last <laughs> thoughts. Uh, oh, but I, I'm, I'm, we're five minutes over, so we're, I, we, that, uh, you get to choose which one you want to do. Um, well, maybe on this um, political versus technical, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and certainly, I think um, you know, there's a general understanding that we're not working in a technical vacuum, that a lot of these interventions are about uh, they're about power, they're about transfer of power, so um, uh, pooling procurement shifts uh, relative power between buyers and suppliers, so does creating competition, uh, putting in place um, uh, creative forms of licensing does the same, and even information, putting solid information into the public domain shifts um, that relative power. Um, but yeah, as others have mentioned, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's everything that comes a, a around it as well that sort of enable us. Then the civil society uh, advocacy is, I think, particularly important, the government ownership as well. Um, so I would recognize that. But also I would say that sometimes it's, it's not bad strategy to dress up political interventions as something more technical. So, um, so, so I suspect <laughs> there's something of that going on as well. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll finish. Okay. Dave, one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I would go to the, the same place, this, this question about uh, political versus technical. And I, I think it, 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 it's a theme that comes back to competition or, or making sure that we don't get too comfortable with each other. Um, you, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, having a, a spectrum of approaches gets us a better outcome than uh, only one approach. And, and um, y you know, I know there are those who disagree. I'm a believer in taking incremental pro progress where we can get it as opposed to an all-in. 
but we don't get the same level of incremental progress to accept without demands for all in. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's incredibly important that, um, you know, we walk out of here and agree that this is something that it's important for us to work together on, but it's also important that we not uh, uh, fail to act because not everyone agrees with the approach. And I, I think that disagreement is really healthy. I think that's a great last point. I did promise you all last nuggets. If you have a tweet size last comment, but it has to be tweetable and tweet size. Nothing stands between people and their coffee and cookies at 6 p.m. So okay, all right. Well, then we're gonna we're gonna let uh, uh, Dave have the last word. Um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of um, our center for joining us. Uh, thank you again to CGD and Amanda and. Uh, Please make sure you get copies of the primer. Uh, send us your feedback, weigh in on the conversation, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Okay. No, thanks for coming.